Let us pray. Eternal God, incarnate word, spirit of flame and dove, enlarge, expand all living souls to comprehend your love and help us all to seek your will with wiser powers conferred. O oh God, grant yet more light and truth to break forth from your word. Amen. Has the time come? It's the question that the disciples can't help but ask Jesus. Is it time? Is the thing we're finally wa we're waiting for finally coming? Are we there yet? If I didn't relate to the disciples needing to ask that question before March of this year, I surely do now 60 days into shelter in place. Is it safe yet? Have we flattened the curve? Did we stop the spread? Can I go back to the gym? Can I go back to church? Can I stop wearing a mask? Can I please see my friends? If the disciples were feeling anywhere near as antsy and impatient as uncertain as I'm feeling lately, I can only imagine they'd be pretty dissatisfied with Jesus's answer. It's not for you to know times and dates that our heavenly parent has decided. And then just like that, he's gone, lifted up on a cloud. Gee, thanks. The stakes are high for us now, and they were even higher for the disciples. They had staked everything on this Jesus guy. They had left their hometowns, their livelihoods, even their families. They went up against the empire that was colonizing their homeland. They defied the religious authorities that had generations of history backing them up. And they did it because they believed in what this unkempt, indecent, irreverent, itinerant rabbi had to say. There's an argument made by scholars of the New Testament that the movement that formed around Jesus of Nazareth was at least as much a revolutionary political movement as it was a religious one. People followed Jesus, this line of thinking goes, not just because of his message of repentance, forgiveness, and compassion, but because they saw him as a radical leader who would lead them in overturning the violent, oppressive colonial rule of the Roman Empire. If that argument has weight, we can see exactly how high the stakes were for the disciples here, at least the ones who were in it for the revolutionary politics. When they ask, has the time come, Rabbi? Are you going to restore sovereignty to Israel? They are asking an urgent political question. Restoring sovereignty to Israel likely meant to them banishing the Roman bureaucrats and, more importantly, the Roman soldiers. It meant restoring self-rule to their kingdom, likely, the per likely in the person of a king descended from their ancient hero, King David. Now, remember, Acts was written by the same author as Luke. If you go back to Luke 3, you'll notice that the genealogy of Jesus that Luke gives clearly establishes Jesus in that Davidic line. So their question is immediate, practical, and political. Has the time come? Are you going to overthrow our oppressors? Has the time come? Are you going to bring justice and freedom to us? Has the time come? Does the revolution start today? The disciples seem to be expecting a timeline of days or maybe weeks. After all, things have been moving fast for them. Less than two months ago, they were with Jesus when he made his dramatic entrance into Jerusalem, openly mocking and defying the power of the Roman Empire, the same empire they hoped he would help them overthrow. They saw him overturn tables in the temple and heard him make speeches decrying the empire and mocking the religious authorities who collaborated with them. And then within a few days, they saw him get arrested, saw him given a show trial, and saw him executed as a traitor. They went from triumph to tribulation in just a few days. All of the hopes that Palm Sunday represented were dashed by Good Friday. But then things changed again. On the third day, Mary Magdalene and other women in their band of radicals came with unbelievable news. Jesus, their hope and savior was risen. Before long, they had all seen him and their hopes were restored. 
Even death couldn't stop their teacher, couldn't stop their movement. The empire had tried to crush them and it failed. They would be victorious. Sovereignty would be restored to Israel. And so eagerly they asked their teacher, has the time come? And they don't get the answer they were expecting. Jesus tells them that not only is it not time, they won't get to know when it is time. Then he gives them some instructions and he's gone, carried off on a cloud. Things are still moving fast though. Before they know it, while they're still looking up at the skies to see where their friend and teacher disappeared to, two angels show up. Why are you looking up at the skies, they ask. And the implication is clear. Jesus is gone. Don't be staring after him, there's work to be done. When do we catch ourselves staring off into the heavens? I don't know about you, but I catch myself doing it a lot lately. Nearly every conversation I have includes some variation of as soon as, as soon as the pandemic is over, as soon as things get back to normal, as soon as we have a new president. And what I'm realizing is that that attitude is preventing me from doing what I'm called to do today. I have to be honest that I sometimes struggle preaching in this congregation because I never quite know if my cultural references are going to make sense to you. I'll admit that most of the time when Jim references a song or a TV show or a movie, I almost never have any idea what he's talking about. But you always nod or laugh or glance knowingly at each other, so I pretend like I have a clue, but I actually don't. So that being said, I hope that at least some of you are already familiar with the generationally transformative musical Rent. Opening off-Broadway in 1996, this retelling of Puccini's La Boheme follows a year in the lives of a group of young artists living in New York's East Village as they grapple with poverty, discrimination, drug addiction, and HIV AIDS. Even if you're not super, super familiar with the musical itself, you've probably heard its most iconic song at least once, I hope. 525,600 minutes. How do you measure a year in a life? How about love? Seasons of love. Another one of the lines from the show that has become iconic is almost a tagline for Rent is, no day but today. The line appears in several songs in the show, including in Another Day, when the alluring Mimi is asking out Roger, who is emotionally withdrawn and distant following six months in which he saw the death by suicide of his girlfriend, his, his discovery of his HIV positive status, and his recovery from heroin addiction. Roger rebuffs her advances, telling her to come back another day, to which Mimi responds, there's only us, only tonight. We must let go to know what's right. No other course, no other way, no day but today. <sighs> that song is hitting me deeply right now. I don't always think that the show is entirely fair to Roger. He's allowed to be upset and grieving and traumatized after everything that's happened in his life. And we're allowed to be upset and grieving and traumatized in the midst of everything that's going on around us. And the disciples, they were allowed to be upset and grieving and traumatized in light of everything they were going through. But that doesn't mean that pushing off living authentically and loving boldly until another day is the answer. Staring off at the sky, wondering where Jesus has gone and when he'll return isn't the answer. Giving up on being our best selves while the pandemic rages, that's not the answer. Counting the days until January 20th, 2021, and crossing our fingers that we'll get a president who isn't a fascist isn't the answer. There is no day but today. Now, no day but today could be a call to hedonism, to callous disregard for the consequences of our actions, but 
I don't think that's what it is in the context of rent, and I certainly don't think that's what it is when it's put into conversation, as I wanted to, with Jesus' assertion that it's not for you to know times or dates that our heavenly parent has decided. Jesus pairs this assertion with the instructions that had become known as the Great Commission. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. We are to be witnesses not to an abstract idea of God or salvation, but to the radical good news that Jesus brought. Release for the captives, freedom for the oppressed, a breaking down of all barriers that divide and burden us. We are not called to be so entranced by the promise of the future or enamored by nostalgia for the past that we lose sight of the work before us. As Dumbledore tells Harry Potter, it does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live. We have living to do today, all of us. We have work to do today, in the here and now. And doing that work today is inseparable from our vision for the future. We love one another because we believe that every act of love makes the world a better place. We advocate for justice and peace because we trust, in the words of Dr. King, that the arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. And we long to be part of bending that arc. We care for ourselves and our neighbors because we want to create a world where everyone is cared for. The revolution that we hope for isn't for the Roman Empire to be expelled from Judea, but it is no less radical. As Christians, we are called, in Dorothy Day's words, to bring about a revolution of the heart. And we know that we may never, probably will never, live in the world of perfect love, justice, and peace. But in Jesus Christ, we are called to live as though we are already citizens of that world and to work to make that world a reality. Why are you looking at the skies? There's work to do, people to love, systems to transform, a revolution to wage, and there's no day for it but today. Amen.